In Greek myth, the titan Prometheus gave the secret of fire to primitive man to keep him warm against the cold. And with the discovery of fire, man could choose to master his environment or to destroy his fellow man. Prometheus' gift gave birth to the modern industrial age, when fire burned coal to generate steam to power the engine. From that steam power, industries were born, raising America to world prominence, able to manufacture machinery enough to turn the tide in two world wars. Back in 1776 in Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith made the point that literally the wealth of nations is what they manufacture. The example that he used in the book was a, a tree limb on the ground. A tree limb on the ground has no intrinsic value, but if you apply human labor to it and turn it into an ax handle, you've got something that now has value and will have value presumably for several generations. It becomes part of the wealth of the nation. For over a hundred years, the whole idea of industrial capitalism in the West was that government was going to invest in infrastructure and uh, provide the basic uh, social services freely. Roads, education, public health, and the idea was that government spending on infrastructure would lower the cost of living and doing business and make countries more competitive. Infrastructure might seem like this abstract term, but really it's some basic things like roads and bridges, but also more high-tech kinds of infrastructure like our, you know, connection to wireless or broadband, those kinds of, of things. And what it does is it connects people. The share of income that we put into infrastructure has gone down starkly. And so now the studies show that the quality of our infrastructure on whether it's roads, whether it's broadband, is on par with less developed countries. You look at a sector like energy, that's important. In the 1980s, we spent twice as much on basic research and development and energy technology as we spend now, 35 years later. That's criminal. In 2017, the American Society of Civil Engineers handed America a D plus grade on its general infrastructure from roads and schools to potable water, rail systems, and the energy grid. If you travel around the country, particularly in, in mid-sized cities that have just been kind of static for the last 50 years, pretty much everything you see was built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 70s. There's just not that much that's new, and it's a, it's a real tragedy. Traveling across the American landscape, I wonder, has America become the new Prometheus? What happened to the American century? What happened to America's ideal of progress? While we see American projections of power abroad, the homeland suffers from industrial de-evolution. The United States is in a situation, and I've said this in my books, comparable to that of, of the British Empire before the First World War. The decline had, has begun years back, perhaps 25, 30 years back, but it, it proceeded very slowly because it was artificially covered over through the inflow of money from Asia and other places. And now, with the financial crisis and the collapse of the home mortgage market, Americans are finding themselves, and middle-class Americans are finding themselves in a desperate situation. America's role in the world is not the pillar of democracy and freedom that it was once uh, seen to be. We, as a country, have the most credit cards per person as well as the most amount of debt per person on a per capita basis, and that's by design of the financial system in collaboration with the government allowing it to happen. The Popsicle Index is the percent of people in a community who believe a child can leave their home, go to the nearest place to buy a Popsicle, and come home alone safely. So when I was a little girl growing up in West Philadelphia, you know, it was unthinkable you couldn't just run up to Spruce Street, play the pins, come home anytime, you know, during the day. And what we've been watching in America as we've centralized control of financial capital is, you know, the Dow Jones is going up and the Popsicle Index is coming down. We have a, a new empire. It's not an American empire, it's a corporate empire. And the, the U.S. government and its many institutions, the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon, support those corporations in, in so many ways. And it's really created what I could call a death economy. This is an economy that's based to a large degree on killing people, or the threat of killing people, militarization. A huge percentage of the U.S. budget goes to the military. And it's also based on destroying the resources upon which it's based, ravaging the earth, tearing up these resources and not replacing them.
in the tradition of Prometheus, first using fire to burn wood, then coal and oil for heat. Man unlocked the tremendous energy potential within the nucleus of the atom itself. But upon entering the nuclear age in devastating fashion, by decimating the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, America began its own slow industrial decline. Today, Detroit looks more like a bombed out post-war city than the thriving town that built the arsenal of machinery that won the Second World War. The arsenal for democracy, when we think of the arsenal for democracy, we often think about Detroit. It clearly happened throughout the country, but so much of the material that was made to fight Nazi Germany and uh, the Japanese was made right here in Detroit. Nothing spells America quite like the automobile. Even though cars were invented in Germany, the individuality, power, and speed of the automobile created a booming demand across our expansive country. By 1960, despite racial tensions and discrimination, the Motor City of Detroit had the highest standard of living in America, thanks to high-paying blue-collar jobs centered around the auto sector. Detroit had a population of about almost two million people in 1950. It's now about a little over 600,000, a terrible loss. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the employment in factories changed. It used to be a factory would have, you know, 10, 15, upwards of 30,000 people working in it. Now, most factories have about 1,500 people working in it. Well, those folks were laid off. And so instead of working in the plant, good benefits, good wages, they ended up getting service jobs that didn't pay the kind of money that could sustain a household. The real issue is not just auto, it was a sole focus on auto, right? It was that everybody worked in auto. People in my generation, millennials, went to school, graduated, and if we didn't want to work in auto, and many of us didn't want to work in auto, we left. You have an entire infrastructure and ecosystem that's built around one really, in theory, strong business. It's, it's not a good model. It's actually, in fact, literally the definition of having all your eggs in one basket. By 2013, the city of Detroit had declared bankruptcy following General Motors and Chrysler's declarations in 2010 as the city's tax base had declined so dramatically. One um, problem with the auto industry is that it takes such huge capital investment to build an auto plant, hundreds of millions of dollars to build a single plant, that it's hard to break it down into smaller companies. We see people like Tesla trying to do that on a smaller scale, but it's hard to do. But you hope that the benefits trickle down to the workers as they used to do because we had this uh, very powerful union uh, system here. And the unions have been largely um, if not broken totally, certainly diminished. And that, is, that has uh, really hurt the bargaining power of the working class and, and lower middle class people. Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, employed workers with high $5 wages in the 1910s under the sound business strategy that his workers were also his consumers. While Ford detested unions and implemented his policies to prevent his workers from organizing, Ultimately, the ascendancy of unions in the 1930s served to protect not only workers' wages, but also their benefits. We saw in the 40s, in the 50s, we saw pensions, we saw uh, health care, we saw all kinds of abilities for workers to be able to save money, a single household family, save money and people were able to put their kids through college. It was a special time. Back in, in the 50s and 60s, People would buy new cars every, every two years. That doesn't happen anymore. And in fact, studies show that about one third of the rise of inequality over the past couple decades has because we have far fewer workers in unions today. When workers are in union, they have more power to negotiate with their boss, but they also have more power in our politics. So we do things like raise the minimum wage, which we haven't done now for quite some time. So the minimum wage, for example, is worth less today than it was in the late 1960s. But now more and more work has been shifted into the service sector. 
where they're just sort of been typically and historically low wage and less unionized. Back over 100 years ago, Ford said, if I can pay my workers a wage that can give them money to, to, to live and buy my cars, that's a good thing for my cars, that's a good thing for the workers. And that was sort of the old philosophy. Um, as you start to get away from the idea of workers being important to the, the strength of a company, uh, that philosophy has, has really died. So what we have now is the financialization and banks sort of running companies and also determining policies. You know, when I started on Wall Street, the idea was an investment bank worked for a company. During that period, it turned from investment banks work for companies to investment banks are predators who target companies and take them over and do the Gordon Gecko thing. And you could watch the money shift on Wall Street. There used to be a theory what's good for General Motors is good for the United States, you know, because, because it was a win-win relationship. That stopped. And, and it was very much, okay, let's just take stuff, liquidate it. Financialization involves living in the short run. If you're managing a company and your, uh, your income and your bonuses at the end of the year are based on how much you can push up the company's stock, you're going to cut back research and development. You're going to cut back any long-term expenditure in order to uh, use the revenue you have for corporate stock buybacks. Corporations have become multinational, and if a, a corporation can move to China or Vietnam or South America and any place where they can find workers uh, in economies that are not yet financialized, then uh, why would you want to live at home? We are constantly reminded that we are the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world. And yet, the only greatness the millennial generation has seen is in its debts while our wages are on average lower than our parents were at our age. I don't have many friends who have made a lot of money on Wall Street. You know, I just don't. GM was supposed to be the stock that couldn't fit. That was supposed to be your retirement fund, right? Well, we saw how that one went. When the auto crisis happened, a lot of the, the, the talk was that, you know, greedy auto worker, that we're not flexible in our plants, that just wasn't true, we were. But I think um, no one talked about the real reason the auto crisis happened. I mean, the banking industry, what, you know, everything that happened on Wall Street, gas prices had gone up, yeah, we had most of our market in trucks. I think it's a shame that the greedy auto worker was blamed. These guys back here who work every day um, and bust their butts to build vehicles were blamed for something that Wall Street created. And now Detroit has a debt, and how is it going to pay? Well, it's paying by privatizing, by selling off uh, its basic uh, resources, just like Greece is told, sell off your port, sell off your water supply. But in Flint, just down the road, we had people make a decision to uh, uh, turn the water supply. Instead of bringing the water from the Great Lakes using the Detroit system, they said, let's save a few dollars and pump the water in from the Flint River which has uh, created a huge lead problem for the residents of Flint. The Flint disaster has brought public attention, not only to the condition of infrastructure in this country in general, but also the way elected officials treat the folks. It's a failure of misguided austerity policies, a failure to invest in our infrastructure, in our water infrastructure. For too many decades, politicians, mostly of the right, but bipartisan, have failed to invest, make public investments in this country, and we are witnessing the extraordinary damage that has caused, and it must wake us up. We must learn lessons from this. If we don't, we are as corroded a political system as these pipes which brought lead poisoning to thousands of children. In America, there's a feeling that you don't need industry, that uh, post-industrialization really can go hand in hand with deindustrialization, and uh, you don't have to uh, make your own uh, goods and manufacturers. For years, we have seen economic reports of manufacturing job losses, only to be replaced by jobs in the service sector that often pay one third of a union wage. Most people then go into debt to make payments for what they can no longer afford. While many economists have heralded this trend as the wave of the future, the post industrial wasteland of fast food chains and strip malls has also created an overall decline in not only American wages, but in our country's general infrastructure and physical productivity. I live in Tennessee, and say 20 to 25 percent of the population is on food stamps. If I call up the food stamp hotline, if I have technical support needs, 
I get someone working for JP Morgan Chase in India who is doing a job I could do, and if I was doing that job, I wouldn't need food stamps. So the government is paying me not to work, and they're paying somebody in India, and they're paying a big markup to JP Morgan Chase, when in fact that's paying twice where they could be paying one thing. Okay. Now it gets even worse because I have land lying fallow all around me and those farmers, small farmers are now out of business. But meantime, I'm shipping food in from a thousand miles away in South America and I'm going down to Walmart to buy it with my food stamps. And the reality is I wouldn't be getting as sick as I'm getting if I was buying from the local farmers and they would be working and not on food stamps and unemployment. One of the most remarkable turnarounds has been the rising mortality rates of white males in their 40s and 50s since the 2000s, largely due to alcohol abuse and suicide. Such a trend reverses decades of progress since the end of World War II. You're seeing a massive squeeze on the uh, white, rural, working class population in America, that something is happening in the last 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. which is creating a health epidemic, uh, which is affecting their mortality in a very negative way. Somehow the right has convinced people that we're subsidizing the poor, and really we're subsidizing these corporations who then are creating the poor. Only about one third or one quarter of what the American worker gets is actually spent on, on goods, on clothing, on transportation, on uh, food. Since starting around the 1970s, workers have continued to be more productive. You know, the U.S. economy is still top of the world, but unfortunately, workers aren't getting really much, if any at all, of those gains. And so what's happened is that wages for men have basically been stagnant for several decades. At the same time, you have core costs of basic middle class goods like health care, housing, higher education that have gone up much, much faster. So you have families really struggling and they'll make a whole bunch of changes to try to afford what they think is a middle class life. And so that means people working longer hours, more women going into the workforce and going deeper and deeper into debt. And so you have this really uh, toxic mix of more hours, more stress, and more debt. But that doesn't describe how seriously the living standard is actually going down. The average rent in New York City is $4,500 a month, so 55, about 55,000 a year. The average uh, income, family income in America is about $55,000 a year. People talk about how they're not being an inflation here, but actually America's had the highest inflation in the last uh, 20 years of any country in the world. The inflation has been the stock market and the real estate market. The Wall Street area, that used to be uh, the electronics area, small manufacturing area, dairy area, but bank credit isn't spent on goods and services. Bank, uh, Eighty percent of bank loans in America are for real estate. You'll see that whole streets are just closing down and are empty and for rent because of the shrinking of the New York real estate bubble. You're going to see as we walk down the street, one uh, store after another, all available for lease, all for rent. Because if you're an entrepreneur right now in America, the last thing you want to do is take risk. I don't want to take on more over, you know, I'm shrinking overhead every time I turn around. I don't, this is not a world I want to take risk in. In 2015, we watched on TV as inner city Baltimore rioted for the fourth time in its short history. While the surface issue cited police brutality and racism for the violence, the media ignored Baltimore's collapse from the sixth most populous city at the turn of the 20th century, when it was a prosperous port town full of blue-collar workers constructing steel for the cars, trains, and bridges America was still building. Now, Baltimore annually tops lists of the highest murder rates per capita, prison retention, and HIV infections in the country. I came down here in 76, and at that time, Baltimore was a blue-collar town. Everything was dominated by the steel plant, the shipyards, Eastern Stainless. My car would be covered with red dust from the steel plant. Now, as you can see, the air quality is wonderful because there's no industry here anymore. At that time, Bethlehem Steel employed 38,000 people. Slowly, things started to shut down. The General Motors plant slowed down. The entire industrialized port changed 
because they couldn't find the money to dredge the harbor. And because of that, even though Baltimore is the furthest inland port on the East Coast and the home of the first railroad in America, big ships couldn't come in. So then the question was, what do we do with the harbor? And you have what today is called the Baltimore Renaissance, which are 28 hotels, the convention center and things like that. It's uh, two very, very separate Baltimores. There is the uh, tourist Baltimore. Then on the flip side of that, you can come to this part of Baltimore and not ever know that that part exists. The people in this community live in a four block radius. They, they, they live, work, eat, shop, everything in this community. Uh, shopping for the exception of a grocery store because we're also in a food desert. They don't have a grocery store here. It's not really a lot you can do here. Mm. Yeah, I don't think so. Anyway. Compared to like your, your parents' generation, they talk about how Baltimore has changed? No. No. If anything, they talk about how it got worse. Sir. It got worse, right? Yeah. It's just, yeah, there's a lot of violence in this city. Um, if we can eliminate the, a lot of violence, it'll be a better city. A lot of talented people here, but you will never know because of the reputation we got, so. We right now have the highest murder rate in Baltimore that we've ever had. Uh, and it's, it's no longer something that they can even connect to the drug trade. They're just finding bodies in the street. The HIV rate is declining everywhere else in the United States. Here in Baltimore, it's increasing by 40% every year. And the irony of it is they blame it on prostitutes, but poor people are not paying prostitutes. That's not how they're getting AIDS. What you have is a revolving door at the Baltimore City Jail. Young guys go in there, they come out with HIV. It's taken a while for us to realize that you know, breaking the law and getting a criminal record and doing drugs and being inactive in society affects my life. Because why, why are they on the corner selling drugs? Why won't they stop selling drugs? Because something needs to be more attractive than selling drugs. They forgot that going to school was what they really needed. They suffering for it. They, all they're gonna do is stand out there, make a few dollars, just enough so they can get their hit for the day, a hit for tomorrow or whatever overnight hit and come back the next day. It's a vicious cycle that they're taking this The out. true thing is, to that, they're slaves. They're the new slaves of the drug traffic. The drug economy has literally replaced the industrial economy of the inner cities. While drugs spell a prison sentence or illness for most young men and women, it also means a quick injection of cash into a banking system that can then profit off the illicit capital. I got three kids sitting on a corner in West Philadelphia where I grew up, okay? They're generating $100,000 a year, say, of profits selling drugs, okay? You run that through a fast food restaurant, you know, that's trading in, at that time a multiple of 20 to 25 times, you can create 2.5 million on those kids, 2.5 million of market value, and that's before you lever it with debt and derivatives. So God knows what you could take it up to. Now, you don't have to educate those kids. You don't have to feed them right. You don't have to bring them up right. You know, but you can get them creating millions of dollars for you. So if you're looking for a lot of money fast, it's much easier to liquidate them than it is to bring them up properly. America, with the largest prison population in the world, has over two million people incarcerated, with nearly five million more on probation or parole, most of whom are African American or Latino, often serving prolonged sentences in a system that would rather punish than provide economic opportunities to dissuade future criminality. Here's the amazing thing about this model. If you, if you look at the flows within a place, the government is spending an absolute fortune for the game because you have all the enforcement of the war on drugs, you have the prisons, you have the local homeowners losing real estate value, you have all the costs of the crime. In Sandtown, Penn North, where we were earlier today, it's insane. You have 1,600 vacant houses. You have 1,300 vacant lots. 
where houses used to be, yet you have all these people who have no housing. It's beyond blight. It really is a, it's a conscious process of depopulation. They don't want poor people to live here anymore. Neurologist Ned Rosinski looked into the phenomenon of what he called death zones in Baltimore as a correlation of poverty to increase the mortality. Uh, what I found was, was what I had expected to find, which was that the poorest areas, the ones with the highest percentage of income below the poverty line, which at that point was 25,000, back in uh, 2000, had the highest death rates. And it was pretty impressive, a factor about 2.5. I was expecting to see it, but I wasn't expecting to see it as stark. A lot of young people die of infections, like they shoot up and they get endocarditis or serious infections. or they just don't get the health care that otherwise would have saved their lives from uh, diseases that are not so bad. And so the younger the person is, the more years they lose. This community was a social haven. Like people came here to see all the live performances, Cab Calloway and Billie Holiday. You know, this is the uh, original Frederick Douglass High School. All of them attended school here. So the, it was a destination. That there was a reason to come here. This is where uh, African-Americans that were pretty prominent came to enjoy themselves, and something happened. Decades and decades of being ignored. A, a community that's undereducated, underemployed, sub-housing, we're blocks away from public housing projects in 2015. People are still housed like animals in housing projects with barely running water or no heat children in households where dad is in jail or mom's in jail or there's substance abuse issues and children are raising themselves or their younger siblings. You saw the city, it wasn't always this decrepit and dilapidated. This is urban blight, but you see these beautiful home, beautiful buildings that are, that are just completely boarded up. Refixed back. Now people come back and we could never have the businesses that the Koreans have in our community. They're not supposed to really be in our community because the money leaves out of the community, doesn't come back. You see like these brothers over here? This is what they got to do now, sell clothes. Right, they create their own little market, market here. Market, own little markets, you know, around here. We try to be self-sufficient too, you know. He having that store there, that means we don't have to go up there to the Korean store around the corner, around there. He stops and shortcuts us. We can get a bottle of water for a dollar here, where she just was telling us a bottle of water was close to two bucks. Businesses really only invest when they think the demand for their products are going to increase. But if workers don't have money, the demand's not there. And so right now, our economy is really struggling along with inadequate demand. And in fact, you can take this point to much bigger. The, the, the reason we had a great recession, we, we, 2007 to 2009, we had a catastrophic collapse, economic collapse. And that occurred in significant part because consumers were sort of helping drive the economy along, but by only by going into debt. As the Great Recession happened, this debt was inherently unstable. People could not continue to pay back the, you know, the, the mortgages they were taking out on their homes. They, and so this, this huge downward spiral that really drove our country deep, deep trouble. And now we're just struggling to get out of it. And I don't see us getting out of it unless we rebuild consumer demand. If globalization has been the mechanism by which corporations have found cheaper labor and goods to grow their influence and sales, then is globalization itself a problem? And if so, what can America do to protect itself from transnational predators? Tariffs represented 100% of the income of the federal government from the George Washington administration to the Abraham Lincoln administration, 100%. All of the money was from tariffs. We used tariffs to protect domestic manufacturers, to keep manufacturing in the United States. The average tariff during that era was around 30% on pretty much everything. And we built this great industrial powerhouse. By doing away with tariffs, basically what we said to our manufacturers was, okay, you know, if you can make that pair of shoes for, for a buck in Connecticut and for you know, 50 cents in Mexico, go to Mexico. You know, it'll cost you maybe three cents instead of 50 cents. You know, here we are, naked in front of the world and uh, you know, in, in terms of the ability to protect ourselves. And, and I, I think it's bizarre that protectionism has become an evil word. There was a time during the New Deal era 
when our government worked to provide the necessary tools for markets to thrive. In the 1930s, FDR's New Deal constructed thousands of bridges, roads, water supply lines, levees, and provided electrification for the majority of the United States. In the 1950s, Eisenhower ordered the construction of the highways that connect our country from coast to coast. President Kennedy called for an initiative to put a man on the moon in the 1960s, giving birth to tremendous scientific innovations in medicine, computer technology, and travel. But how did we stray from that vision of endless growth? The elites in the United States at the close of the uh, Second World War uh, realized that the depression was ended as a result of the war. And so many of the elites felt that what we, what we should do is maintain somewhat of a war posture or a military posture to be able to subsidize uh, the nation uh, and not fall prey to a, a de depression. And what was built uh, on that is, of course, what we call the military industrial complex. Eisenhower did push for the road system uh, on a basis of a military uh, gain, but it absolutely was uh, unbelievably uh, brought prosperity. Uh, the, the kind of prosperity you're talking about uh, that then shifted ground uh, with the Vietnam War. From 1965 until 1973, the United States engaged in a prolonged and bloody conflict in Vietnam it not only cost the lives of millions of Americans and Vietnamese, it cost the United States its trade advantage as it sank into debt to finance the war. During the Vietnam War, uh, and during the 1960s uh, and early 70s, the entire U.S. balance of payments deficit was military. Military spending was pumping dollars into the world's uh, central banks. If they'd spend it in Vietnam or in Japan, uh, it would all be turned over to the French banks, the German banks, and they would cash in these dollars for gold. Fearful that foreign countries trading their dollars in for gold would sink the value of the currency, President Nixon decided to break international agreements by restricting the dollar from further convertibility to gold in 1971. Instead of gold, oil would become the new commodity unofficially backing the dollar. This petrodollar economy was sanctified in 1973 when the oil-producing countries of the Middle East, backed by Saudi Arabia, embargoed oil to the Western powers over their support of Israel during the Six-Day War. As the price of oil shot up 400 percent, global consumers paid the price at the pump, while the American banking system cut a deal with the Saudis. That deal essentially said that Saudi Arabia would invest them in U.S. Treasury securities not give it back, but invest it in securities, and the interest from those securities would be used by the U.S. Treasury Department to hire U.S. corporations, essentially to westernize Saudi Arabia, to build petrochemical sites, um, desalinization plants, in fact, whole cities out of the desert. Westernized cities, it was a process of really westernizing them. And it, w it also part of this deal was that, Sa that Saudi Arabia agreed that OPEC would never and it increased the price of oil to any levels above what the oil companies would accept. And, very important one, that oil would only be traded in dollars. Now this is major because just before that, 1971, Nixon had taken us off the gold standard, taken the dollar off the gold standard. So the dollar's floating out there and, and there's a real concern that the dollar's gonna lose its power in the world. But by making sure that, that OPEC would only buy and sell, would only trade oil, and U.S. dollars that put us on a new standard, the oil standard, which in a way is more powerful than the gold standard in some respects. And we've been on that standard ever since, pretty much. But it's not only the Saudis who are profiting from our addiction to oil. Wall Street brokers now transact hundreds of trades over every barrel of oil sold, turning energy futures into a speculative game of profiteering. We started to move towards a financialization of key commodity markets. And beginning in 1981, we started trading uh, on the, the New York Mercantile Exchange crude oil futures. And this was really the first foray to try and shift commodity pricing away from state oil companies and onto financial players. Before the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, about 85% of the trading volume in oil uh, futures were done by producers and end consumers with only 15% by speculators of the financial type.
By 2010, that had become 85% speculators and only 15% producers and uh, consumers. And so what we saw was a complete turnaround of the market, where a market that was originally designed to help get consumers access to fairly priced market had become just another Wall Street casino, uh, Wall Street financial firms setting those prices. It was Chase that had the most uh, stronger relationships with the Middle East going into the 70s. Um, they had a lot of oil relationships in particular. The, the former chairman of Chase, um, a man named John McCloy, had been a lawyer for the Seven Sisters Oil Companies. So if they could get into the Middle East and basically source the profits from petroleum profits that were denominated in dollars and extract those profits, they could use them for other types of international expansion, and that's exactly what they do. And so that became this, this circle of extracting the oil money, lending it out, going bust, having the government bail them out, and that became sort of the new normal. While the tremendous wealth generated by petrodollars has exploded the bank's collateral, deregulation since the 1970s has allowed banks to expand across state and national bounds. And uh, under the Clinton administration, we saw the demise of Glass-Steagler and, and a number of other laws that have been set up to separate the banking industries, that the commercial banks from the investment banks, and what, all these things that had been established after the Great Depression uh, fell apart, came down, because the banks had enough power that they could force our elected officials, essentially, uh, to do the things that they wanted done, which meant loosening all the regulations. So as banks have continued to consolidate more, it means that there are fewer banks imposing these relationships with their customers. So for example, today the big six banks in the United States control 42% of the depositors' in money in the United States. That's, that's a significant low. That means that you know, almost half the country has no other bank. So therefore they're tied into these relationships and these large institutions by virtue of being large and by virtue of understanding they have a captive audience continue to pour money into extracting more from them. In other words, they can use deposits to leverage into speculative trading. They can use credit cards to dump on these same people who are giving them their deposits at higher and higher rates. During this period, America was in the leadership position to basically rebalance the global economy. And one of the ways it did that was by shifting capital out of the United States and reinvesting it abroad. And in the process, financing some of that by globalizing and outsourcing labor. This instrument of debt has not only been deployed against the American people, but against foreign countries in order to create conditions for corporate control of key resources and industries. In the process, American investments increasingly turned away from our country in search of higher profits abroad. For me personally, uh, as I got into the business of being an economic hitman, and my real title was chief economist, but I was, I was a con artist, was basically it, working for the World Bank, and I had grown up and gone to business school and with great respect and appreciation for things like the World Bank. But as I got into it deeper, I, I could see how this bank was just manipulating the world and how that was, my job was in fact to use the bank as a vehicle uh, for, for coercing countries with resources our corporations coveted into going deep into debt and putting themselves in a situation where essentially they had to give away those resources, things like oil, and privatize their public sector. You look at oil, and oil is itself a, a multi-trillion dollar a year commodity and industry. But when we spend money on oil, we are propping up some of the worst regimes on the planet. You look at Saudi Arabia that gets all of their money from oil. We say we, we hate ISIS for good reason. ISIS are, are terrorists. They behead people. Well, our allies in Saudi Arabia behead people too. And it's our dollars at work propping up that regime through the gas tank and then through direct military spending that we have. If we spend $700 billion a year on the U.S. military, what fraction of that is really about making sure that we have access to oil supplies? At least a couple hundred billion dollars directly to the military budget is really about securing oil supplies. So the lifeblood of transport being oil has made us wedded to oil and it's made us wedded to these regimes and states that don't share our values and that we would rather see uh, go through a lot of change. Much of the United States budget uh, was financed not by taxes, 
but by foreign balance of payments deficit. The more Americans uh, spent uh, abroad, these dollars ended up in foreign countries. A lot of them ended up being paid uh, for oil, and the oil countries ended up buying uh, treasury bills, as did uh, Europe, Germany, France, Japan. Japan, especially in Asia, were financing the American uh, deficit. In effect, central bank reserves were based on American military spending. So foreign central banks were uh, financing the surrounding of their countries with military bases, surrounding them so that uh, they didn't really have a choice uh, if they wanted to politically break, they end up like Iraq or like Libya or now like Syria with uh, having a regime change and, and an invasion. So uh, basically countries were financing their own subjugation. We have seen our military grow to encompass the globe with bases, along with direct military actions in dozens of countries on a daily basis. Our annual military budget ranges close to a trillion dollars, not counting the trillions that have simply vanished from Pentagon accounting books. Augmented by billions of dollars in arms sales to countries like Saudi Arabia, our major industry, aside from IT, banking, healthcare, and real estate, has become militarism. And 9-11 was the perfect excuse uh, to really go uh, after uh, militarization in a big, big way. And of course, since then, it just expanded. And it isn't just the industries that make the weapons. It's also their bankers. It's their insurance companies. It's their healthcare companies. It's the people that provide uh, food to them. Coca-Cola bottling companies that are in their location, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a mushrooming industry, and it's a savage industry. It's, it's part of this death economy. If we are to end this century of war and its economy of death, we will need new ideas, Promethean ideas like adapting fire to generate heat for energy rather than for bombs. We can develop technologies to fix the problems before us rather than letting the economy of debt drive us into perpetual wars. But how do we get back on that path of economic growth in a time when our leaders restrict our growth with fears of spending because we are now a nation in deep debt? It's got to have an economic agenda, which it doesn't yet have, and one, one that addresses the fundamental problems of the out-of-control federal debt, uh, the out-of-control private household debt of, of, of the country, and the fact that the economic policy of the last 30 years has let the industrial base of America go into the scrap heap and allowed outsourced by large multinational corporations to Asia and elsewhere that has simply destroyed the, the productive work base of, of the traditional American economy. That has to be brought back. So we need to turn this death economy into what I call a life economy. And, and I think this is extremely viable and, and it can be an easy transition if we will just move forward with it. It means paying big companies to, instead of making missiles and war equipment, and make equipment to clean up pollution. Good Lord, our, our oceans are terribly polluted. Rivers around the world, lakes are very polluted. They can be cleaned up. The, the soil, the earth is polluted. The Amazon's polluted with oil and so many other things and, and so much of the, the planet. The air is polluted. There's a whole industry, amazing businesses waiting there to clean these things up and to create new technologies uh, for transportation and communications, energy, banking. And there's a huge opportunity here. If we could just put the U.S. taxpayers dollars to work doing that instead of paying companies to make equipment and systems that, that kill other people. If you were to say, let's cut the military budget in half, we'd have a depression in the United States. And so what has to be done is a policy of causing these very sophisticated military contractors to, to spin around and concentrate on what China is doing, is to build an infrastructure uh, that has been nothing like that in human civilization. In all of human civilization, there is no nation that has taken five to 600 million people out of poverty into middle class. And that's what China has done in the last 30 years. While China has actually found itself with a shortage of labor from its industrial boom, the United States wallows in close to 10% real unemployment with 15% of the population on food stamps. The average American has seen his wealth decrease by one quarter since 2009. Yet we have come to believe that this is the price of greatness, that we have nothing left to build 
Or, as some environmental extremists argue, there are too many people on the planet. They contend that economic growth itself has outstripped our ability to sustain our way of life. Japan's population is shrinking. If you look at China, China's working age population between about 18 and 60, that has just hit its highest level and it's starting to drop. You look at uh, Europe, many European countries are now seeing their aged population grow out of bounds and Europe is approaching a point where its population will start shrinking. So contrary to this idea of overpopulation, we might have too few babies being born. In the studies that I did back in the 60s, we found that the countries that st whose standard of living went up, their population multiplier went down. So if we could give people the basic needs, what makes them happy, we need energy production for that. By 2030, probably a 50% increase in demand for energy, 30, 40% increase in demand for, for food, 50% for water, a uh, billion and a half more people, maybe two billion, three billion more in the middle class. Huge growing demand, more people urbanized, more urbanized people, and more demand for energy among all the other resources. The number one thing in an economy, the best driver of growth and well-being is new ideas. But the second biggest thing in an economy is energy. Around the world, we spend $4 trillion a year on energy. It's maybe the biggest industry there is tied with healthcare. Around the world, we, there's more than a billion people that don't have electricity. And if we don't do anything to get that electricity, they're gonna burn coal. Uh, to get their transport, they're gonna put oil in that gasoline tank. America must kick its addiction to polluting the earth by burning resources, and invest in its future productivity, then we must reassess our relationship to the most powerful form of fire we have yet to harness. We entered the nuclear era in 1945 under the shadow of nuclear holocaust. But when nuclear power was harnessed to produce more energy than oil or coal, the new technology was burdened by public fears of a nuclear meltdown, radiation poisoning, and the proliferation of nuclear weapons to foreign countries. We have this irrational fear of nuclear power. And nuclear power has its issues, but it's far safer than people imagine. You look at the Fukushima uh, disaster. That was a 40-year-old reactor. It was not built to modern specs. It was not built to modern design. Modern reactors can't even have that happen to them. You can cut off all electricity, and they keep recycling through the power of gravity. That's an innovation that's out there, that's in every reactor that's being built right now, but our images of nuclear safety are based on what we thought happened at Chernobyl. You wanna see how a, a non-market state built a nuclear reactor, that was it right there. We have not caught up to the reality that every year coal power kills nearly 200,000 people around the world from air pollution, and nuclear power kills basically zero. There are alternative fission schemes that are potentially much safer than the ones that we're using, and the Indians are very interested in thorium, uh, even a thorium breeder cycle, which would be am amazingly efficient. When you use it in a, in a liquid molten salt configuration, the reactors can be made unconditionally safe. So if you lose power, the system simply freezes and the reaction stops. Thorium power offers an additional benefit. It can utilize our nuclear waste that currently sits in abandoned mines, guarded to prevent proliferation and radioactive toxicity. We have here, we're sitting on mountains of nuclear waste, which we're not really properly addressing. We're just saying, oh, we're going to bury this. But as everybody knows, um, you bury something doesn't mean it just goes away. It's still there. And this, this nuclear waste could be actually put to good use inside one of these sub subcritical reactors and burnt. The problem exists. Even if you stop nuclear energy right now, you're still left with uranium, plutonium, actinides, a whole nasty uh, cocktail of radioactive compounds that you need to dispose of. Now the question you have is, do we just store it underground, or do we try and do something useful with it? While 20% of America's energy still derives from nuclear fission, 
Our government has chosen to largely abandon investment in nuclear energy since the Carter administration. Rather than working to improve safety and close the recycling process to convert nuclear waste into energy using the thorium fuel cycle. The reason why we're pushing for this solution is, although it's more difficult, it has uh, huge advantages in terms of uh, waste, so it produces a lot less waste. Another big, big advantage is that it's uh, potentially a lot less proliferating than uh, uranium. Uranium was pushed for a very long time because it was the established, uh, it was the established route of nuclear power. The reason it's established route is, unfortunately, it came from the military. And this has always been the original sin of nuclear power, one that has tainted the development of this technology forever, which is that with this particular technology, the bomb came first and the reactor came second. So that led, of course, to great advances in technology from which the reactor profited but it came from a military development program which was focused entirely on building the bomb. Any new energy source has to be nuclear. Nuclear processes are 10 million times more energy effective than chemical processes. You need much less material. It's, it's not exactly renewable, but there's a plentiful supply of nuclear uh, source materials, uranium and thorium. If the worst came to the worst, we could get them out of the sea. So we can make a viable energy future for mankind with nuclear. And the question is, which flavor of nuclear, fission or fusion? The prospect of nuclear power that has most excited the scientific mind since the splitting of the atom is the idea of fusing atoms in a peaceful reaction. Nuclear fusion could create a nearly infinite source of energy to power mankind's future. You take two particles and you weigh them, and then you cause them to fuse at high temperatures and high pressures. When you then look at the reaction products and you weigh them, they weigh less than the two particles you started with. And that energy released is equal to the mass times the velocity squared, Einstein's EMC squared. Well, basically it's the process that generates heat and light and energy in the sun and in stars. The hydrogen bomb was the first um, application of being able to do that on Earth, the most powerful explosive that we have. And as soon as that was done, many scientists started to think, well, is there a way to slow that down, that energy release, and actually be able to capture that in a slow, steady process for using it to make electricity, for example. The biggest uh, event in our country was in the uh, mid-70s. Up at Princeton, we had built a new tokamak, and for the first time, we raised the temperature of the plasma to this 50 million degrees, which the Chinese are saying now they have also. We hit that in 1975, but 50 million degrees by itself is not enough. You also have to confine this for a long enough time to get interesting amounts of fusion going. In 1980, I helped organize with the Fusion Energy Foundation and others a bill that passed Congress and President Carter signed called the Magnetic Fusion Engineering Act of 1980 and it was never implemented. I was told then by Hans Bethe, who was the chief theoretician at Los Alamos during World War II, who originally had worked with me to try to push this fusion, was told you're not allowed to do it. And who told him? Well, the major banks and the, the major oil industry. They said, you're not allowed to do this. This is, not, this is verboten. After 1980, you had Thatcher in England and Reagan in America saying, let's privatize, let's turn over the roads, let's turn the roads into toll roads, and let the buyers uh, charge as much as they can. After I left being an economic hitman, uh, for about 10 years I ran an alternative energy company. And, you know, everything that we did, we had to raise millions of dollars, and the banks had such control over everything that we did. You could have a great technology and that would save pollution and so on and so forth, but if the banks didn't like the technology because perhaps it was going to be a threat to some other organization or company that they had interest in locally, a coal company or an oil company or, or something, they would make sure you didn't get the financing. As a result of the bonanza of privatization and deregulation, we have seen government investment in new energy technologies dwindle, diminishing incentives for high-yield energy programs like nuclear. Yet these are the potential tools available for us to kick our addiction 
to the limited resources that currently drive our economy. But of course the problem here is, is that as technology and innovation is presenting uh, more cost-effective uh, and more environmentally friendly alternatives, the oil industry is actually doubling down and digging in their heels and, and trying to uh, uh, expand their influence uh, over our policies. We're stuck in this place in our economy where we base an awful lot of it on burning these finite stockpiles of energy. Oil, natural gas, coal. They're finite. When we burn them, we deplete them, and they cause that air pollution, that smog, that water pollution, that climate change, all of it. There are other ways, though. We don't have to assume that the only way to prosper is to burn out a finite resource, because almost everything else in our economy works differently. If you look at materials, if I build a car out of steel, is steel a finite resource? Well, kind of. But at the end of that car's life, that steel gets recycled. Half the steel we use these days is from recycled sources. So we can get to a closed loop economy where we're reusing the materials again and again and again. Now, is that the case with energy? It's not now, but it could be. Well, we are told that economics is predicated in scarcity, that our world is a finite ship in space. The marvel of nuclear power reminds us the tremendous energy potential which exists within every single atom just waiting to be unleashed. And if energy and mass are convertible, perhaps the Earth is more infinite than we can yet imagine. Fusion operates with plasma. Plasma is taking the atoms and taking the electrons off, and you have just the nucleus and the electrons. So you can now separate all of the 92 elements. So you can take anything, radioactive or not, and break it down and separate it out. You can break up garbage with plasma, but what you get is a gook and some gas. What we're talking here is really taking and recovering all the basic elements that are in whatever you put in this system. So you're working with ultra high temperature plasmas. We call them fusion grade plasmas. While our government could currently invest in full recycling programs using plasma torches to empty our landfills, our future could also include deploying fusion energy to turn our waste into a fuel source in itself. That Promethean promise is what makes the quest for fusion so important. But such a breakthrough energy as nuclear fusion would also shatter the petrodollar economy. Perhaps that future will spell the decentralization of power where states and communities can use the Promethean gift to make heat from water. You take a gallon of seawater, in that gallon of seawater is a few grams of heavy hydrogen. No, there's a, just a drop of the seawater. That drop of seawater has the energy equivalent of 300 gallons of gasoline, and it costs a couple pennies to extract the deuterium from the gallon of seawater. <laughs> That's the name of the game. Energy is the fundamental source of human life. Before the discovery of electricity and burning fuels, human labor, mills, and stock animals generated that energy. But we are now on the brink of a revolution. Since US government investments in developing fusion technology have dropped by half since 1980, private companies like TriAlpha, General Fusion, and Lockheed Martin have taken up the lead to find a way to make nuclear fusion a reality and that our future will not be subject to the decay of consuming resources to fuel our needs for power. The U.S. is not doing fusion very aggressively right now, but that doesn't mean we don't have an industry that, whenever we're ready, can't go like gangbusters and catch up to everybody. That's sort of the game plan, as best I can tell, for anybody in the U.S. government that even cares, which there aren't many. They would say, well, we'll just wait till the Chinese and the Japanese figure it all out. And when they've got it all perfected, we'll just step in and we'll just leave them in the dust with Westinghouse <laughs> or Bechtel, you know. That's the attitude. Why should we pay for it? Well, the good news is the government programs, in particular all the work in tokamaks around the world and ITER, as well as laser fusion, have really built a, a huge reservoir of research. Um, scientific papers, data, simulation codes, um, all of those we can benefit from um, and build upon.
The problem with fusion is that you put some energy in there to heat this gas to 150 million degrees C. That's very hot. And then you have to keep this gas for long enough to make enough fusion to make more energy than the energy it took you to heat it up in the first place. And this is a very simple thing in life. If you have a big rock, it takes longer to cool down than if you have a pebble. So the bigger the blob of plasma that you make, the longer it will stay hot, and therefore the more chance you have to make more energy. So if you make a blob of plasma the size of the sun, that works good, like the energy takes a long time to escape from that. A nuclear explosion is actually also a large blob of plasma with lots of energy from the initial bomb that starts it. But we want to do that at a smaller scale. So the problem is how fast will the energy escape? Like how good is the magnetic field to keep the, the energy in there? If the energy escapes fast, we will have to make a large blob of plasma to last long enough. Fusion comes in two forms, hot fusion and cold fusion. We're working on hot fusion at a very large reactor in the south of uh, France, ITER. The world, the, the Western world, has poured all of its resources into this uh, single hope. There is no prospect of any energy coming out of uh, a hot fusion reactor, at least not out of ITER, until well into the 2030s. So that is not going to solve our problem. While delivering hot fusion to customers is still a dream for another day, a low energy nuclear reaction, once dismissed as cold fusion, might be nearing application for the general public. Companies like Berluin Energy are beginning to generate interest in their technologies of creating a fusion reaction without needing to generate millions of degrees of heat. It can be demonstrated in the lab, not easily, but it can be demonstrated, but it has been demonstrated is a more important statement. So the existence of a nuclear level heat effect in the deuterium palladium system is unquestionable and anybody that, a, that reviews the literature understands what has been done will come away with the conclusion that there is a nuclear level heat effect. So Fleischmann and Pons were right. In 1989, renowned electrochemist Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons announced a nuclear reaction at room temperature. But when other scientists failed to replicate their experiment, cold fusion was pronounced dead. And the scientific argument against cold fusion pretty much goes like this. Back in 1989, uh, it was proven to the satisfaction of the scientific community that the experiment wasn't reproducible. And questions were asked as to how it could work. And it was pointed out that it was, um, that the effect itself seemed to go against uh, conventional nuclear physics. The scientists tend to be very conservative lot and so if it's the case that cold fusion is um, perceived to go against scientific uh, theory or earlier scientific experiments in nuclear physics or hot fusion then there will be reluctance to accept the results we tried for years and years decades in fact to science this thing into existence to do good experiments to publish in good uh, journals when when we were able to do so Robert Gardas approached me probably three years ago now. He said, we have a system that can be controlled. It was, the control was by a subtle means of a current pulse, but they were able to demonstrate to my satisfaction that they could turn the effect on, turn the effect uh, off, turn the effect up, which is obviously what you need for any uh, commercial uh, object. This is the... Uh, the, the next generation wet boiler. So this is a basically two liter uh, vessel. Mm -hmm. We fill it about halfway with electrolyte. It's designed to produce about 30 kilowatts of thermal energy. That's power. enough power to, to heat the average US household. This is proof of a cold fusion reaction. Right, and now I'm gonna turn on the electrolysis and in just a, a couple of seconds here, it'll, the water will heat up enough that it can no longer uh, that can no longer pull the heat off. And you can hear the sound starting to, to, to change. And in just a couple of seconds, you'll see little flashes of, of light, which is actually destroying the core. You can see sparks are starting to actually form because as the water gets hot, they can't carry the energy away fast enough. You can, you can see sparks sort of forming sort of on a regular basis back all along the surface of the core. 
I'm not worried that this research will go forward. Silicon Valley's funding it, and you know, innovative fusion work has been funded by private entrepreneurs recently, even more so than government. You know, you see companies like Tri Alpha or General Fusion getting funded. Things are going forward. The thing that's embarrassing is the government's not helping. In fact, the government's interfering. It's not like other governments are confused. Uh, Japan just decided to put 27 million into a program at Tohoku University on this. We'll either get all of our energy from this technology, LENR, or all of it from, um, from molten salt reactors, which we buy from China because of the lack of, I wouldn't even say leadership, I would say the lack of followership in the US government right now. So we just gotta get past the denial movement. One of the questions that comes up frequently is, uh, well, if this is a true phenomenon, why isn't it seen in nature? And uh, I was very proud of Robert Goddard because he didn't miss a beat. He said, well, you get your oil from Russia and you have fluidized beds to convert it, right? And he said, yes. He says, well, don't you see these massive heat excursions randomly? He says, that's LENR, and you could have heard a pin drop. I said, it is found in nature, isn't it? Is that yes, it really is. It's not something new, we just didn't know what it was. But cold fusion has some wonderful uh, advantages. It has shown itself so far to not have any significant amount of nuclear byproducts. So it's safe and safe forever. It has really no economy of scale. It works on the home scale. So the average home in the United States consumes at say 10 kilowatts, thermal and electrical. We can operate, we can build cold fusion reactors potentially on that scale and meet the demand home by home. So people, everybody can go off the grid or get connected by the grid to improve the stability of their uh, power resource. Such a decentralization of energy is already occurring with the evolution of solar and wind-based energy. I think what you're going to see, and we've been using this term lately, and of course it means different things to different people, but smart grid. You're going to have a more uh, computerized grid that can take different kinds of energy along transmission lines, substations, distribution lines, and on the building or campus site itself. You're going to have uh, electric energy storage, like big battery banks and pumped hydro in that process and uh, also uh, combined heat and power and waste heat uh, into the process. So you're gonna have more energy production and energy storage closer to the customer. Before I did anything, I did energy efficiency. It's always less expensive to save energy than generate it from any source. People are proposing storage as a solution for this problem. But storage, in my opinion, will always be quite a bit more costly than making electricity. Because in storage, there's two steps. You go from the electricity, you go to a storage media, step number one. Then you go from an energetic media of some sort and you make electricity. The needs of a population are increasing because the technology is also demanding more energy. We're inventing lots of gadgets that use more and more electricity. In America, you've got this Elon Musk who is advertising uh, electric cars. Those cars need to, to, be, to be hooked onto something. So the question is what? And of course, you can use wind, you can use solar, but these are intermittent sources. Germany has tried it. The net result is that when there's no wind blowing or the sun isn't shining, they're switching on their coal power stations. And the net result is that Germany is actually becoming a, a nation which has a greater and greater coal imprint. And also, if you ever think about the far future, where you'd like to have, you know, a spaceship or stuff like that, uh, solar and wind is not the energy density required to do those things. I think the fusion research will not only impact energy, I think actually might have more impact on things like space travel and how we handle matter and, and, and how we uh, regenerate resources. Nuclear energy will be a necessity for future generations. Today, with the advent of, of fracking uh, and the cheap and natural gas, uh, even, even nuclear systems can't compete economically with the cheap natural gas and that is giving us a problem because what that does means that we close down all the fission plants, not because they're not working or uh, there's anything wrong with them, it's just that they're not economic. The challenge has been that the oil industry is using the newfound fracking production boom as a way to change that narrative. 
and to say the United States can now become not only energy independent, but can be a leading oil exporter and we can use those oil exports as the new commodity diplomacy to improve U.S. standing abroad, particularly with our allies. And that's really a Nigerian model of economic development and of uh, diplomacy. It is a failed strategy, not just because the fracking boom is unbelievably temporary, it's going to be uh, peaking in less than a decade, but it also takes us away from leading on the types of innovative uh, technologies that are going to be dominating in the 21st century. And fusion already is generating uh, spin-offs in other areas without making energy. And so investing in that doesn't mean that's the only thing you're investing in. Investing in that uh, may turn up like we already have a way to make isotopes to detect cancer. Superconducting magnets, for example, high temperature superconductors, a lot of those, uh, a lot of that work was aimed at fusion. Uh, and of course now we use that for MRIs and, and other diagnostics that, in the medical field. Uh, that's another spin-off. This country is based on spin-off from 1775. It's always been spin-off. Railroads, the most recent spin-off, the computer, huge computer revolution that we're in the middle of. Where did it start? It started with torpedoes during the Second World War using creation of servo mechanisms in the torpedoes. The torpedoes could lock onto a ship that they was aimed at, and if the ship seemed to be drifting, which meant the torpedo was drifting, the torpedo rudder would move and it would get back onto the ship. And that created a computer revolution. To put a man on the moon, you couldn't carry those computers with you, though. They weighed tons. So we had to have microchips. And to put a man on the moon, we had to develop microtechnology. President Kennedy, the man who created a crash government program to explore the final frontiers of space in the 1960s, also had ambitious goals for a more terrestrial endeavor, but no less important. President Kennedy was going to initiate a program to bring water from Alaska down to turn the West green, to turn the American desert green, including California. This program was going to be the centerpiece of his second administration in 1964. It's called the North American Water and Power Association. And California wouldn't be burning now if we had, had done that program. It would take 30 years to develop, but it would have paid for itself a hundred times over by now. While even some of the oil titans, like the Rockefeller Foundation, are starting to distance themselves from this energy source, we are now hearing talks of a coming century of water wars centered around man's most basic need. 70% of the water we use is to grow food. No water, no farms, no life. Right? But here again, innovation can tremendously improve the situation. When we look at the fresh water that humans have access to, it's about one-tenth of one percent of all the water on the planet. It's a thousand times more water than we use. Most of it is salt water in the oceans. Can we turn that salt water into fresh? We can, and we've gotten better and better at it. It used to take a gigantic amount of energy to desalinate salt water. It was just boiling the water. We've cut that amount of energy by 90%, and we can keep cutting it lower and lower and lower until it's clean enough, cheap enough to provide water for our cities and for our farms. The desalination of salt water is highly energy intensive, but deploying nuclear fission to make our ocean waters potable is one investment that is long overdue from our government. In the future, the ocean water itself could power the fusion energy processes fueling the desalination process. But for the present, many have come to view big government as an alien entity that taxes its citizens rather than transnational corporations for war and welfare handouts. We have forgotten the basic necessities of life that can be provided by government initiatives to provide us the freedoms for enterprise in growing domestic markets. An investment in our country's future is the most productive use of our national wealth. If you look at road systems, if you look at train networks, if you look at anything that has a network effect, the market doesn't figure out how to do those things on its own. They need right of way across property lines. They need to generate revenue for the whole country, not in a way that a private business can easily absorb. So in those cases, government 
should be more entrepreneurial because no private entity has the muscle or the scale to do it and because for the country every dollar we put in in this investment is going to generate two or three or ten dollars of return ultimately. We have to remember that government has always played a role in infrastructure development in the United States. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, Congress was uh, ordered to construct all the postal roads, which was, you know, the 1790 version of the Internet. It wasn't left up to the free market. It was put into the U.S. Constitution because it was seen as such a central uh, government function for the new nation. 1791. George Washington asked Alexander Hamilton to come up with a plan to make America prosperous. And he came up with uh, his uh, plan, 11 point plan on manufacturers. And one part of it was tariffs and things like that, you know, to protect domestic manufacturing. Another part was incentives, but another part was infrastructure. And he said, you know, we've got to build the national infrastructure to be able to, to, to facilitate a manufacturing economy. And so from the, literally from the George Washington administration to the Ronald Reagan administration, everybody understood this. What they could do is they could build maglev trains across the United States. They could build a new road structure. We're so beset by the elites who control our society with greed and wealth, the 1%, that they build these fantastic buildings in New York, but you don't have the roads to get decently to these buildings. The government's a tool. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. We've used it for both. But what you're talking about, Sean, is to reinvigorate the economic strength that we have in this country towards a peaceful end. Why not invest in retooling our auto sector, to upgrade our rail systems, to build high-speed trains, and connect our cities for commuter transit? As for um, high-speed rail, I don't think I'll see it. And bluntly, I don't think you'll see it either, the pace at which they're, 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 they're failing to build high-speed rail. But just around the corner from here um, is, is an example, I think, of, of a new economy. The new urban manufacturing is popping up around America. There's, you know, associations of people writing about it. And it, it really comes down to, you know, the chair that I'm sitting on. Uh, today's chairs, you know, you sure you can buy them in Ikea and they're, they're manufactured in Bangladesh, you can put them together. But if you want something a little bit more interesting, a bit more stylish, perhaps using alternative uh, materials, then you can buy them locally. People are beginning to realize that there's a market for products that we want and uh, these can get built here rather than getting them built in, uh, in, in offshore. You look at things like 3D printing where you can make things at home. And we're used to thinking of 3D printers as making just plastic parts, but there are now high-end 3D printers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they can make pieces out of metals. They can make them in designs that you can't make from forging, for instance. You go to Boeing uh, near my home here in Seattle, and Boeing has 3D printed titanium parts in its jet engines because that was the best way to build a part to their spec. So that's a big part of it, but the best 3D printers aren't ones you'll have at home. There are still ones that will exist in factories, but they will change manufacturing because they get rid of the supply chain. So that means that if you're a factory owner, uh, why would you move the factory to China now? If your customer's in the US, you can put the factory in the US. But the danger is how many workers does that factory need? And it needs less per unit of output than it ever needed before. You hear a lot of times announcements in the news and states that you know plants are coming back into that state. They're getting subsidized heavily by the government. But what people don't talk about is that the workers, the jobs are there, but they're not good jobs. They're actually making 10, 11, $12 an hour. And on top of that, they pay often $250 a month in health care. So the real wage is even lower. So what you see is a lot of workers, mostly in non-union shops, um, that are manufacturing parts, building parts for a car and they're working 10 and 11 hours a day and then um, walking into a food stamp line. And so they're literally working full time and um, making poverty wages. And I think a lot of people, when they think of uh, low wages, they think of the service sector. But the truth is it's happening in the manufacturing sector. The real jobs in the future are gonna be less doing repetitive things and more doing novel things, right? It's gonna be analyzing the information, dreaming up new product ideas, marketing it, programming the robots, that sort of thing. The things that are innovative 
and idea creation or idea synthesis, where you're bringing ideas together, that's where the jobs are going to be. Anything that is a repetitive action, we're gonna automate that. By the way, those jobs where you're always doing something new are the most creative and the most fun. So we should be happy if we can transition our workforce from doing routine tasks to doing more creative and more innovative tasks. But shifting our service economy to provide meaningful, creative and innovative work also requires an effective system of education as the basic infrastructure for a living economy. It could be handled like it is in Europe and uh, Asia. It's free over there. Now, if you have an American graduate having to pay uh, a huge student loan, and student loans at 1.2 trillion are now larger than all the credit card debt in America. In fact, the United States was the leading country in first in the world to provide public education up through high school. And that made us the most educated country in the world and helped drive our future growth back in the early 1900s, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Today, the situation is unfortunately a little bit reversed. 20 years ago, U.S. was still number one in the world in college graduation. Now, we are middle to bottom of the pack of advanced countries, and that has happened in significant part because we have failed to make public investments in higher education. What you need to do is to let the very competent and ethical people locally start to rebuild the economy. And it's very unique. Every place is different. It really comes down to, you know, who are those 20 or 2,000 people, depending on the county. You know, America breaks down to 3,100 counties. So who are the net energy plus people who want to rebuild the economy? And then you just have to let them loose. And part of that is bringing the cost of capital back down to a market level of capital and, and getting out of their way. Over the past 30 or 40 years, we've had a sharp decline in the number of entrepreneurs in our economy. And a big reason why is to become an entrepreneur, to start a business, you need some money. You need some capital to start your business. And fewer and fewer people have that right now because most Americans are in debt and their wages are stagnant. We wanted to do the equivalent of a, of a stock corporation for a neighborhood where you could create a venture pool that could be publicly traded, the pension funds could invest, and the small businesses could access equity capital so they wouldn't be dependent on the banks and it would significantly lower the cost of capital and then everyone in the neighborhood could make money when they shopped at the local stores and ran into a buzzsaw because you had the big guys coming wanting to come in with franchises. But one of the things that we see as being viable and possible is that in communities that are revitalizing, so you look at Detroit or you look at Baltimore, or you look at any of the cities that are, I guess, typically categorized as being you know, under some set of urban plight. One of the biggest problems within those communities is a lack of ownership. In, in my opinion, at least, that you don't really care about insulating the small business community of your neighborhood because the owners of those businesses are so often not from the neighborhood. If I don't have any connection with you, if you don't do anything then to I reinvest in my community, you don't hire people from my neighborhood, I'm not gonna shop there necessarily. I'm not gonna feel compelled to shop there. Um, so there are kind of two ways to, to fix that problem and we think that uh, equity crowdfunding is a great answer for both of them actually which is you find local operators who are from the, the area that they're trying to build businesses in and then you find local investors who are also from that area. If I am an owner, even a very small owner of your company, I'm probably going to patronize your company. Listen, if I buy Coke stock, I'm never drinking Pepsi. It's that simple. Thus, as technology provides us the tools to decentralize work, Perhaps we will find our food, goods, and productivity closer to home. You lost your job in an automotive factory. Great. There's new jobs installing solar. There's lots of new jobs writing software. Do you have the skills for those? Maybe you don't. So in the ideal world, that person could live a life of dignity. And in the ideal world, we would help them get to a point where they have new skills that can benefit them and that benefit everyone else. And if the market doesn't do it on its own, we're idiots if we don't invest in that person. Because if you invest in someone and you help them get the skills to do a good job, then they benefit, they're not dependent upon a handout anymore, and they produce value for all the rest of us. So the human mind is the most valuable resource we know of. And to let a mind go fallow, to let a mind go unutilized because we don't give them the right job retraining or because they're a kid born in poverty and they don't have a good school, that's criminal and it's self-defeating.
by believing in our country's future and in our planets, as President Kennedy once called for. I've spoken about uh, the new frontier. It refers instead to this nation's place in history, to the fact that we do stand on the edge of a great new era. It is a time for pathfinders and pioneers. We can build greater cities than those yet seen. And perhaps, one day, cities on worlds we have yet to explore. But first, we must recognize that our world is not a system running down into death and decay, but a living, vibrant system that provides us all the resources to live, create, and grow. In Greek myth, the Titan Prometheus was punished by the gods for daring to offer man fire, for it was more than a tool. It was a symbol of hope. Let us not imitate the gods in punishing Prometheus, but using his gift, energy, to free ourselves from the limits of our own ignorance. Our future can be more glorious than our past. And if we take that vision for America, that our country is worth investing in, that we can transform our debt-driven financial instruments into a credit by which a new America can be built, that we can confront the lie of the finite with the infinite resource of man's creativity, that we can give birth to a living economy, providing for our fellow man by growing our way out of poverty, then perhaps our world will have hope the 21st century will be a century of peace rather than a century of war.